most importantly, again, welcome Nazan for the second talk in the series of public lectures at San Francisco, California Institute of Integral Studies for the purposes of the recording, if there is any anthropology and social change. Uh, Nazan is, I will remind you, in Berlin. That's really late. So, Nazan, I assume you're going to employ the same method as yesterday? Yeah. Okay. So, we should be gentle with questions, not push it too long, but of course, some questions. And uh, again, welcome, Nazan, and we are really looking forward to having you. I don't know if you can see me from there. but Not it, really. In any case, <laughs> looking forward to hear the lecture tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I had promised already that I will talk today uh, on what the human at the universal mean in the Kurdish movement. And I will actually this time rely a lot on the book uh, that I have talked to you about last time and on the chapter on the guerrilla, who are we and how must we live, the chapter's name is, and it's I'm looking now which chapter it is. It is the fifth chapter, who are we and how must we live, being a friend in the guerrilla movement. So basically, uh, I will reinterpret that chapter um, and uh, put it in a new framework. And my argument will be that the human and the universal in the Kurdish women's freedom movement are open categories that are collectively explored and practiced by transgressing what we already are and have been. Now, maybe just a couple of notes why I am uh, interested in uh, what uh, the human is in the Kurdish movement. Uh, first of all, I mean, there has been, I'm sure you are aware, there has been a cautious return to the idea of the human and universalism uh, in scholarship, especially uh, a, a rethinking of what how the human and universalism were practiced in the South during anti-colonialist movements. A lot of a lot has been published in recent year, recent couple of years on that topic. So I want to bring Kurdish women's freedom movement into that discussion. And I find that uh, it is important for Kurdish women's freedom movement to um, be brought into this discussion for a couple of reasons. One of them being that they are uh, rendered inhuman in the region they are in through uh, very different discourses. One of them is that they are terrorists. You know, I mean, the Kurdish, not the Kurdish freedom movement in general, but Kurdish uh, guerrilla is considered to be a terrorist organization in Europe, in America, and in the Middle East. Uh, then there is the fact that uh, the, the uh, states that are colonizing uh, Kurdistan, Iraq, uh, Iran, uh, Turkey, and Syria, uh, more and more utilizing post-humanist discourse. That is, you know, we are different, we have Islamic culture, so we don't really need to uh, adopt uh, ideas of humanism because they have been de developed by, uh, by the colonizing West. So they are also resisting that. And they are also resisting the universalism of Islam, the kind of Islamic universalism that is. That, that means uh, Kurds are included to the Middle East on the basis of the fact that they are, they are uh, Muslims, but uh, the Kurdish freedom movement also rejects that kind of inclusion. Uh, so, and when we talk about, that's another reason, and, and finally the reason is because when we talk about the Middle East, we usually talk about Islam rather than the left tradition of the region and the uh, feminist tradition in the region. And uh, the new uh, understanding of the human and the practice of humanity that the Kurdish women's freedom movement develops is claiming that heritage as well. 
uh, although they are departing from it and they are situating themselves in a more intersectional perspective, but still they are also claiming that kind of um, uh, that kind of uh, tradition. I think all of these make uh, what they have to say, what they are uh, arguing, very interesting. Uh, now, my argument will be that the human and the universal in the Kurdish women's freedom movement are open categories that are collectively explored and practiced by transgressing what we already are and have been. Further in this talk, I will or argue that we can name the praxis of humanness in the Kurdish movement as friendship and that it is under the sign of friendship that decolonizing of humanness occurs. By decolonization of humanness, I basically mean the decolonization of the genres of freedom making, truth making and being. And in the Kurdish context, I will argue, decolonization is not so much a return to an original culture before colonization, as much as an exploration of new laws and norms, according to which we can practice humanness and universalism, constituted by collective reflection and action. The framework of my talk is informed by the PKK's leader Abdullah Öcalan's prison writings, and maybe surprisingly, the writings of the Caribbean scholar Sylvia Winter. Although probably they never heard of each other's names, Winter's and Öcalan's thought on the human are strikingly similar. Both problematize the existing genres of the human grounded in Western colonialism, capitalism, racism, and patriarchy. In other words, they both challenge the stories we tell when we claim humanity in the existing world because the genres of these stories, the plots, the terms in which we give meaning to them, all these have been determined by a series of exclusions and repressions. In their writings, moreover, both Winter and Öcalan similarly search for a new genre of the human. Winter orients her search towards Africa, where the human first emerged, and Öcalan to Mesopotamia, to Kurdistan, where the Neolithic revolution occurred. It is from these lands that they become inspired and deduct that the human shouldn't be seen as a noun, but a verb, and must be practiced rather than claimed. Now, there is, however, one significant difference between these thinkers. Whereas for Winter, it is race that gives meaning to modern narratives, and therefore it is the Black people who would and should come up with a new genre of the human. For Öcalan, it is the Kurdish women whose practice should be a basis for the new genre of the human. Actually, I would argue that we can read all of Öcalan's thought as explaining this argument and all of his praxis as developing a craft to create this. Now, two questions emerge in this context. Obvious questions, why Kurdish, why women? It is Kurdish because the Kurdish are dispossessed from land as much as a historical narrative that would trace their oppression to a single origin. They are displaced from the progressive temporality of modernity as much as the kind of mythical time the nation state form represents. Therefore, for them, the universal and the human along with culture and tradition, are radically open political formations that are not given. For Kurdish people, their search is not oriented towards the past, since the past is always already unavailable to them, and there is no accessible original Kurdish culture to return to, where, for example, women have not been oppressed and repressed. The answer to the question, who we are we, therefore, in their case becomes, who do we want to become? And the human emerges as an aspiration and as a becoming. 
The basis of the new genre of the human is women, on the other hand, because in Öcalan's thought, exploitative power emerged in human history with the dispossession of women from the means of production, self-defense, and knowledge, the devaluation of their reproductive labor and care work, and their consequent enslavement 5,000 years ago. This puts Kurdish men and women in different positions in the social order at the struggle. Whereas the structural violence of colonialism makes life unlivable, both for Kurdish men and women, the fact that women are, in addition, subject to the condition of fungibility under conditions of patriarchy and its, its institutions, especially marriage, condemns that, them to social death. Becoming a guerrilla, a Kurdish guerrilla, for example, for Kurdish men entails a sacrifice, a giving up of a promised position and autonomy in the social order gained in return for cooperating with patriarchy. In the organizations they create, therefore, men tend to replicate patriarchal agencies and relations to regain what they have given up. For women, on the other hand, there is no such position promised that they long for. They are structurally rather than contingently dispossessed. This makes them particularly suitable subjects for coming up with new laws for their desires, unsupported by the existing art order. In other words, since, since women are historically the first colony, according to Öcalan, and enslaved on whose objectification the social order rests, it is only through women's liberation and an understanding of humanness and sociality based on the struggle for their liberation that society can be freed from the laws of familyism, colonialism, capitalism, nationalism, religionism, industrialism, and scientism, all of which prevent us from practicing humanity. This is what the Kurdish slogan, Jin Jian Azadi, attests, women, life, freedom. The organized search of women uh, uh, for freedom or for a life that matters pushes them to explore collectively what a human life could be, could look like, and according to which laws and rules would it be shaped if oppressed people in general and women in particular would have the collective capacity and means to remake and rename the universe democratically. So in my book, I explain how in, in women's quest for a new praxis of humanness, mythology in Mesopotamia becomes a source for finding out laws other than the law of the father. The ethical choices of individual women become norm-forming and exemplary, and ideological and strategical failures of women's movements in the world become critical lessons. I also explain that according to the Kurdish women's freedom movement, the human is foremost a friend to the world, someone who has cultivated a self whose thought and deed are the same and who is capable of finding solutions to problems. She is in a constant struggle to free herself from the residues of colonialism, capitalism, and patriarchy in her personality, and in her care of self and others, produces an alternative ethics and aesthetics. Finally, to use the language of Karen Barrett, she is to be a leader whose success is measured by the queer communications and unexpected flirtations she can initiate, she can initiate. From Arin Mirkan, maybe you heard her name, she committed a suicide bombing against ISIS to motivate her friends to stand their ground in an almost completely invaded Kobani in 2014, to the founding member of the PKK, Sakine Jansas, 
who is famous for initiating impossible dialogues with women who distance themselves from the freedom movement, to Berivan Jinzire, who single-handedly mobilized people and ignited an insurgency in the city of Jizre in 1992, women leaders of the Kurdish movement are expected to deploy seductive overtures, overtures that lead to powerful discharges. Now, in the rest of my talk, I will more closely focus on the genre of human as friend in the movement. What does that mean? and explain the specific terms under which this genre is practiced and narrated by the Kurdish women's movement. So what is friendship? What does it mean in the movement? Okay, I'm gonna zip. Members of the Kurdish freedom movement and specifically the cadre of the movement declare themselves as, as a friend in general and not a friend to something or someone specific, complicating what is usually understood by friendship. The term friend in the movement becomes a predicative term. Friendship designates a position in a particular revolutionary grammar, a particular form of self-cultivation, and a specific form of attachment to the public. Friendship is both a push that forces the people in the movement beyond themselves and the pull that grounds, regrounds rather, their sociality, anchors and sustains them. It is actually a form of being and becoming, making it close to Foucault's understanding of it as a way of life. Franz and Foucault's view are those with whom we work on the historical conditions of our existence, existence and those with whom we share the practice of becoming who we are. The Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK, defines itself as an organization of relationships that transforms people into revolutionary subjects. And friendship, Hevalte in Kurdish, is the name of an in prison, in organization, and in combat, accumulating perspective and knowledge in which, uh, in which these relationships will be molded. In the PKK's view, it is in the company of friends that one journeys towards truth and freedom and being. Friendship is a form of loyalty that cannot be contained within nation, property or household. It cannot be transformed into utility and cannot be exchanged. It involves both equality and differentiation. It develops through harmony as well as conflict, recognition as well as criticism. Friendship, most importantly, puts the person in the mode of play rather than inserting her in the melodramatic or the tragic that unfolds in the familial realm, thereby making her a subject of freedom and ethics, unauthored but played out, never fulfilled but always offered. I don't think that the kinship between Foucault's, I mean, I'm not accidentally using Foucault, uh, I mean, just for name dropping's sake. First, both understandings, I mean, both Foucault's and Kurdish freedom movements uh, understanding of friendship developed under the shadow of death, where friendship as a way of life mutates, always already runs into friendship as a way of death. While for Foucault, the AIDS crisis contextualizes his later thought on friendship, for the guerrillas, the context within which their understanding of being a friend developed cannot be thought of as independent of the constant reality and threat of being killed by the state, but Turkish state particularly. Second, through the concept of friendship, Foucault wants to give a name to the forms of pleasures, relationships, coexistences, attachments, loves, intensities that develop outside of heteronormative encounters linking sexuality and truth. 
in the Kurdish freedom movement too, friendship becomes a name for all those invisible affective gestures that refuse alignment along, along the secure axis of filiation. With their status as friends, the members of the movement who were born and raised in a strictly kinship society find themselves in a state where they need to invent from A to Z the ethics by which they will relate to each other and to others. As revolutionaries, they need to enact transformative intimacies with people of the same sex or different sexes, different age groups, and different collectivities. They also must re redefine their mutual dependencies and duties, their relations of responsibility, without giving up their asexuality. I can talk about this asexuality. If you ask me in the question session, I will not talk about it in the uh, main body of the talk. Uh, but it's important to say asexuality in the Kurdish movement is a way in which sexuality and truth are delete. Becoming a friend is also a praxis of decolonization. Decolonization of truth in the movement entails finding new laws to live and die by and forming new norms to be cited that will help people to act and change the symbolic order, order supported by relations developed within capitalist modernity. Decolonizing freedom, on the other hand, is, is inscribing these laws and norms on the flesh of the world through velocity, meaning giving, and creation. Decolonization of being, meanwhile, becomes living a form of life in the mode of play and transforming life and death into offerings, thereby initiating new communications. None of this can happen al alone. Friendship, as it unfolds in, in the intersection of the questions, who are we and how should we live, is the ontological relationality without which humanness could not be practiced. So in the rest of the talk, I will talk about the decolonization of truth, um, <clears throat> freedom, and being within or under the sign of uh, friendship as a genre of the human. Now, a friend in the Kurdish movement, Hewal, as we say in Kurdish, defines uh, the members of the movement or a friend, sorry, a friend in the Kurdish movement, a heval, in other words, defines herself first and foremost as a searcher for truth in our words and deeds. The movement believes that the greatest weapon of domination is the creation and circulation of truths and subjection of selves to such truths. It is therefore of utmost importance to identify first which forms of truth are detrimental to the movement, its struggle for freedom and humanness, and its members' level of participation. By this is a collective and always ongoing process sustained through rituals, meetings, statements, reports, debates, friendship, and how friendship is, uh, yeah, is ritualized in the movement are important spaces where the search for truth is realized. Sorry, I missed something there. Modern friendship involves the sharing of secrets and the revelation of true selves through such secrets. The form of friendship promoted by the Kurdish freedom movement is different. It is instead against confession and towards mutual transformation by collective labor. Such mutual transformation entails that the person embedded in relations of friendships becomes a subject against subjectification and strips herself of those aspects of herself that have been interpolated by dominant structures. As one of the leaders of the PKK explained to me, truth is not whether an utterance or a position one takes is right or false. It is not about who said what and did what, 
with what intentions and to what end. It is what that utterance or position will make that person, whether the debate itself will help that person towards her struggle. Consider the following excerpts from a diary written by the guerrilla Zinarin between January and September 1997, just before she died. Her diary addresses another guerrilla friend, Melsa, with whom she parted ways because of their separate assignments. In the first pages of her diary, Zinarin states, I wanted you to know my insight, the depth of my heart, the projections of the painful, joyful, excited, and sore moments of my struggle, I will tell you. However, as we later find out, by the depth of her heart and her insight, what she means is neither her secrets nor her suffering. Rather, the depth of her heart refers to her struggles to increase her own capacity to participate in the life of the movement and to be to increase her capacity to act collectively towards freedom. My fugitive feelings, quote, my fugitive feelings are selfish. They eat up my sensibilities, soul, thought, fruitfulness, and time. I am being exploited by my fugitive feelings. Yes, I rebel against my fugitive feelings and dreams. In order to defeat the outside, I must first defeat myself. My anger at myself and at our weakness pushes me to become the opposite of me. It pushes me to become us, to become something else I don't know. I think and I believe that as I live in war and according to the war, I will become a more mature, deeper and emotional person. I will become more myself and take root in my country. I hope that as I fight in the war, I will overcome the unnecessary and residual parts of myself that do not really belong to me and that woman's heroism will also materialize itself in me. Sometimes I feel that my emotions are waning and my material aspects are dominating. I feel like I am losing my sensitivity. I think about something I did and I see that I have approached the situation materialistically, that I haven't transferred a thought that was molded with feelings into it, that I didn't really put myself in it, that I approached it superficially in an ordinary way. That is when my anger over myself is at its most. If you ask about me, what I call difficulty and stress, are the emotional burdens of things I have difficulty carrying and the newness of things I have to live as I walk towards a new process in a new milieu. This is the first time that I have experienced the enemy, the war, the martyrs, being always in danger of dying, fighting the struggle of freedom and gender equality in a place where feudalism and reactionism are so strong. Suddenly, I have found my character to be poor, unprepared, helpless. And this has stressed and nauseated me. I see it as my indispensable duty to apply the principles and the necessities of freedom under conditions of combat and reactionary feudalism. But I neither have the organization, nor the plan, nor the tactic for it. Uncle. Zinarin's text is intimate and powerful. It is addressed to a friend who is assumed to be going through similar troubles in order to achieve an elevated self, worth of the woman's and people's revolution, whose truth and actions are one and whose mastery of the self is accomplished. It is a writ text written in between two deaths, as Lacan would say. say Zinarin rejected the place given to her in the symbolic order. She has left her kinship behind the and the reactionism and feudalism of the people with whom she enters the war still carry the traces of those kinships. 
and she wants to leave them also behind. She is now in search of new laws to give to herself and new norms to perform that can be cited by other women. However, for this, she needs friendships that will her help her fight against her fugitive feelings and motivate her to act in creative ways. Zinarin's fear is that at this point, she cannot be a good friend in the organization because she fails to apply the principles and the necessities of freedom under conditions of combat and reactionary feudalism. Nor does she believe that others in our good group are good friends because of their feudalism and re reactionism, which prevents them pr from creating relationships that would generate collective power and joy. Zinarin's goal is to get rid of all that is added to her personality. She's struggling to change herself, to rid herself of all those disciplinary processes that subjected her and to develop alternative modes of being and becoming. Zinarin is stressed not only because she must deal with the feudalism and sexism in the organization, but also because she is unable to find the capacity to engage with the people she is to get together under the sign of, signs of truth, friendship, ship, and humanness. Now, Zinarin never loses sight of the fact that the subject is historically formed and must be deformed and reformed through historical, according to Kur the Kurdish movement, mythical and revolutionary practices as well. As Öcalan says, in each individual, the whole of history can be read and remade. Zinarin aspires to a transformation of herself and her community and searching for the means to do that in order to become a subject of history, of myth, of revolution. This diary, although it is to have, uh, addressed to a friend, depicts Zinarin's relation to herself. More than a lack of self-knowledge, it seems that her trouble is that she fails herself in her quest for truth, for making her thoughts and deeds one. From the whole of the diary, we understand that the friendship she is yearning for is not exclusive to Melsa, through whom she addresses her diary. Rather, in her training at the house of the leader Öcalan in Syria, Zinarin and others have found such a friend above all in Öcalan himself. Öcalan tells it all, speaks frankly, frankly, has no secrets. His childhood, his former marriage, his relationships with his parents and with the members of the movement are openly discussed and he transforms them into collective contemplations of the questions of who we are and how we should live. Through his speech, he activates people, creates ruptures in their senses of self, and invites them to engage in relations of, of responsibility that are, that are other to those dictated by capitalist modernity, and specifically, actually, to conjugal affiliations. He also encourages others to talk that way and criticizes harsh, harshly those whom he feels are still subjected to kinship relations, capitalism, and tribalism and their laws. For women failing to free oneself from enslavement, and for men, men failing to kill the man inside oneself are the catchwords that he and others use to describe such a situation of untruthfulness and unfreedom. In her search for truth, Zinarin eventually enters combat, despite her friend's warnings that she is not yet ready and is killed. In the preface to her diary, Öcalan describes Zinarin as someone who owned up to her words, someone whose life and deed were the same. She is also someone who followed her desire, unintelligible to the movement at, that, at the time as it is. And it, it is, according to Ajalan, up to the movement 
to become a response to this desire if the movement wants to practice humanity. That is, it is up to the movement to create an environment and an organization where Zinarin's desire can be signified beyond that. Zinarin's and others women's deaths that could have been avoided or rather delayed were, and were rushed in their search for new laws must now become a basis for rethinking relationships and friendships and the capacity of the PKK to give them the means to perform new norms while living. If the decolonization of truth occurs in the movement through self-transformation, by finding new laws to follow and forming new forms to be cited in the context of friendships, freedom, decolonization of freedom, refers to the capacity to change the world along with the self. Now, in his books for the, for, uh, that form the paradigm of the Kurdish freedom movement, Öcalan defines freedom as motion and energy. Freedom involves rescuing oneself from the rigidity and capture that capitalist modernity enforces on collectivities and individuals under the ideology of sovereign free choice and possessive individualism. Inspired by quantum physics, Öcalan says that freedom entails contagious differentiations, multiplications, and pluralizations occurring in entanglements, as can be observed everywhere in the universe. Freedom is opening oneself to unexpected relationalities and movements by make, making commitments and initiating communication. Moreover, he adds that while life wants to move towards heterogeneity, it is ethics that secures such heterogeneity by linking all forms of matter and life to each other. For Öcalan and the movement, such ideas are not theoretical, but must be constantly practiced and be inscribed on the flesh of the organization. For example, whenever he has been able to communicate with the movement, Öcalan proposes that the freedom movement, women and other democratic forces, create new social and political bodies and the existing ones structurally transform their identities and their roles so that movement and mobility in social and political life are secured. And politics will not be reduced to management and administration dominated by habits and conventions. In this way, those who are at the core of existing organizations will be unsettled and the way will be clear to up open new opportunities for those at the margins. One further result of creating new organizations is the practice of non-sovereignty. The existence of a multiplicity of organizations operating in different and overlapping spaces and the complicated shifts in authority and relationships among them ensure that no single body will ever capture and monopolize the means of power and rule. To the contrary, the fact that a number of constantly changing institutions and administrators are simultaneously responsible for operating in any given field prevents each of them from remaining closed in, on itself and forces all of them to remain in communication. It also guarantees that decisions made on the basis of the authority acquired by one organization can never be realized unless they are validated by others. Motion velocity also secures an ethics of impersonality in friendship relations and encourages an anti-identitarian politics. Friendship, when personal, when not a position in life, but a relationship with a significant other or others can very easily transform into identitarian politics. Indeed, the Kurdish freedom movement initially suffered from such politics when coming from the same region, class or gender was used as criteria for inclusion or exclusion 
from certain networks, which Dinarin calls feudal in the entries in her diary. One way in which impersonality in friendships is achieved is through assignments, which keeps friends in the movement constantly on the move and renders them literally homeless. In the Kurdish movement, any friend can be assigned to anywhere as long as she does not challenge the assignment on acceptable grounds, uh, which makes it hard to continue personalized friendships. She is expected to be a general friend to all, to care for them and be committed to a mutual transformation wherever she goes. An impersonal self is cultivated and secured because her assignments needs to her to create and recreate new bonds with impersonal others and carry out impersonal encounters without ceasing to be a friend. For the Kurdish movement, in addition to entitling mental and physical motion, freedom is also closely related to the capacity to make and give meaning. Movement becomes freedom to the extent that people give meaning to it. In order to develop the capacity for meaning, an individual or collective must first liberate and disconnect themselves from the hegemonic sets of meanings. However, this alone is not enough. It is also to necessary to produce explanations and stories, narratives, in which an increasing number of people can recognize themselves and th their experiences. A friend is someone who achieves freedom by the search for meaning in her activity. Um, okay. Reading and learning, contributing to guerrilla life or to the life of the organization in any other capacity, uh, doing, making philosophy, participating in combat, laboring for the sustenance of everyday life are all regarded as endeavors toward freedom, truth, and humanity as long as they are transformative and increase the person's capacity to be a friend. Situating freedom in such activities as much as on the struggle itself, makes the members of the movement appreciate the slow workings of the organizations of the movement's life as freeing without necessarily getting rid of the urge to be in the middle of action. However, neither movement nor developing an autonomous capacity to create meaning is a sufficient basis for freedom. Freedom also requires that people increase their power to actively build new things. Freedom is not doing what one wants to do. On the contrary, it demands the immense effort and willpower that allows a person to push oneself, to overcome one's limits, to go against one's habits, and to labor for and invest energy in oneself, one's relationships. That isn't involves self-care and care for others. For example, when women increase their physical capacity or acquire information and skills that are primarily in the domain of man, they increase their power to build, to create, and they feel more joyful, independent, and free. Similarly, as the Kurdish society builds its own institutions and takes the means of production, reproduction, and self-defense back from the nation state, men and the elite, they liberate themselves. Finally, the capacity to build, just like the capacities of movement and meaning making, collectivizes the concept of freedom and makes clear that a person's freedom depends on the freedom and autonomy of the collective within which, which they live rather than being independent from it. Now my final section, what is the decolonization of being? Well, the Kurdish movement has lost tens of thousands of people to the war with Turkey. Some of these who died were new recruits, young, inexperienced, but heroic nevertheless. 
Others were well-established names in the movement. What does it mean to have so many friends lost to the war? How to give meaning both to the death drive that animates the guerrilla and the mourning work that becomes part, part of the guerrilla's psyche and practice? In other words, what kind of a human is the guerrilla, the member of the Kurdish freedom movement, who experiences joy even or exactly when she is under the imminent threat of imprisonment, death, displacement? And what does that have to do with friendship? Now, the guerrilla occupies three different worlds at the same time. In the world, world uh, that is ruled by the war on terror in Turkey, in Iraq, Iran, and certainly in the West, where the PKK is seen to be a terrorist organization, she occupies the zone of non-being. Her ontological existence is denied. She is symbolically deadened and condemned to a death-bound subjectivity. The zone of non-being anonymizes and de-individuates her, forecloses the need for any further knowledge about her, and produces an anxious need to exclude her from the realm of human intersubjectivity. Through the writing, speech, and action with which she addresses the global world, for example, during her resistance against the Islamic State, she first tries to seize access to human ontology. Seizing access to ontology in this case necessitates, however, paradoxically, dying in the war for an abstract humanity defended against the Islamic State, which in turn is dehumanized and deontologized. Ironically, she quickly, as it happened after 2015, she quickly slips into the zone of non-being when she fights against the Turkish state, a NATO state um, seen legitimate by the European, uh, by the Western countries. Second, the guerrilla occupies the communal zone where she exists as a member of the Kurdish people. She is the one who fights for Kurdish freedom. Her body and flesh, her writing and action, and the diplomacy she conducts with various actors initiate new articulations that lead Kurdistan to the world as a space of revolution. And that's where universalization of Kurdistan occurs as a space of revolution, rather than as an underdeveloped zone of violence. Yet from an everyday of point of view, she's outside of Kurdistan, re-entering it only when she dies to be buried. The moment she leaves her natal home, she becomes dead bound and perceived to be a living dead, already mourned, dead but alive, admired and loved, remembered and constitutive of life of those she left behind. Finally, she also occupies the friendship zone where her everyday life unfolds. Here in this world, the dead and the living are together as the letters, names, memories, and stories are frantically recorded, retold, and rewritten, and this desire for which they died become laws for the coming generations. Addressing the question of whether there is a distinctive form of political agency that emerges from the conditions of death-bound subjectivity, a lot of scholars have turned to Lacan's reconceptualization of the death drive as ethical cause. And they have talked about Antigone, and I am uh, really hoping that you know Antigone. Antigone uh, has been seen as the figure of the drive. And, um, uh, well, maybe I should skip this. Maybe you are, um, okay, I'm going to skip this. But I can say this death drive that people associated with Antigone 
is associated with the zone of non-being, where the person is symbolically dead, ejected from the social order and condemned to execution. And it is from this condition of symbolic death, where life is already lost, that a new and radically transformative order of life and praxis of human becomes possible. So there is firstly the symbolic immortality granted to such a subject if their sacrifice is witnessed, recognized, remembered, made, of, made part of history, mythology, revolution, commemorated and afforded. And then there is secondly, the prospect of how the existing symbolic order might itself be altered by virtue of such a sacrifice and the newness it brings into the world. So we have to underscore the point, the symbolic life that comes from re repeatedly marking a death, firstly, and the life of a newness at birth, emerging by virtue of the fact that the symbolic order has been shifted. When Kurdish guerrilla says, regarding Kemal Pir, one of the founders of the PKK, who died in Diyarbakir prison in 1984 during a hunger strike. We love the zone, we love the world to the extent that we would die for it. Maybe this is what they mean. In the zone in which they are living as non-beings, the guerrillas respond with the creative work of their death, joyful that their death will become an event that gives rise to mobility and uh, fidelity among their community and friends and be signified with discourse, meaning and action. Or maybe friendship formed under the sign of death leads both to the appreciation of the finitude of life and estrangement from the world. In our time, in which the, friend, the death of friends is inescapable and acceptance of death's imminent, death's imminence to life becomes unavoidable. Life becomes perhaps a hundred times more appealing when death is omnipresent. Yet a clear separation between the two realms is no longer sustainable. It might be this shared estrangement and this life becoming a hundred times more appealing that animates the death drive of the Kerala and makes her joy joyful. Or maybe it is because they live in a cosmological time where they see their death as value producing and yet mundane labor that make the world a more livable place that they can sustain a war where tens of thousands have died. I shall never know. What I know is that the guerrilla wants her life to be decided wants her life to be decided on here and now and offers her life and death to be played out. She thereby becomes a historical, mythological, revolutionary subject that works on the conditions of life, on the conditions of life and forces multiple nation states that colonize her to play her game instead of fulfilling her life cycle as part patriarchy would have commanded at the first place. Thank you for listening. Ajan, thank you a lot. Can you, can you hear me? Excellent. Okay, let's begin the questioning. Questions, interrogations, ideas. <laughs> and the first one is Leslie, and she's going to come closer to the computer so Nazan can hear them. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering about when you um, talked extensively about the Kurdish Workers' Party and how uh, this promotion of friendship, you know, and solidarity is so central. Um, I'm wondering if you can explain some practices or exercises in particular which promote the friendship to grow 
Um, I understand that some of this is also through, you know, lived experiences about trauma bonding um, through these kinds of intense situations out there. Um, but yeah, I'm just wondering, besides that reality of the trauma bonding, what might there be as far as intentionable, actionable ways in which the friendship is kind of upheld? Okay, I mean, my uh, paradigmatic example is what they call platform. Platform is where friends will come together, uh, members of the movement or members of the organization or uh, people who are in any way, uh, including me, for example, uh, who are in any way related uh, or supportive of the organization. And platform is where we all come together and talk about um, a, a criticize each other and criticize ourselves. But this, so it's a criticism, self-criticism uh, platform where people basically, I mean, it's not so much trauma bonding, I must say. It's not so much, uh, again, talking about, uh, talking about uh, suffering or talking about secrets or talking about the past, but it is much more about talking about desires, talking about what we want to become and what kind of... Uh, weaknesses we have, uh, what kind of obstacles there are that prevent us from becoming what we want to become. Uh, this is, for example, one of the rituals that have, but dancing is another ritual. Uh, dancing, for example, the Govent Halai, uh, where people, Halai is a, a very important, uh, again, ritual dancing, where people will hold each other's uh, fingers uh, and they will form a circle uh, and there are uh, patterned movements that people do but each person although there are patterned movements that everybody does each person in her uh, like body ca uh, can use her body to express the intensity she feels with the music but then there are also bad dancers who cannot do that they are carried in the pattern so that the collectivity carries every individual, whether uh, whether they are uh, you know good dancer or bad dancers, and in that sense the collectivity and the friendship in the ritual are ritualized, which I see also as a materiality of universality, as I talked about yesterday, difference without separability. So these are the two rituals, for example, uh, I would uh, I would give reference to. Thank you, Nazan. Who's next? While we are waiting, if I can ask you something. Sure. What I'm curious about is criticism, usually constructive criticism that came from some parts of the movements, other mo movements other than the Kurdish one, that the Kurdish, the cadre of the Kurdish freedom movement is attempting to do a sort of an ascetic move outside of the society by doing the elevating of the self and doing a sort of less prefigurative and more uh, centered, I'm trying to do it to justice, uh, more uh, self-centered on virtue upholding a certain kind of collective virtue, which can exist only above the movement and outside of society. By doing that, they are creating or recreating perhaps the kind of ancient Christian move or just Christian move of being separated from the society. And by doing that, they're also reproducing or uh, bringing back the idea of the vanguard of a group that is separable and separated from the society and can never really become a part of society. Now, this is usually followed by the criticism of the asexual. And I know that you wanted perhaps to say a few words about this asexuality as a form. I think you use a very interesting phrase, delayed, a form of delaying truth and freedom, right? Uh, so uh, this is something of delaying sexuality and truth, right? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, yes, but what about the society? 
and mm -hmm. we then reproducing the vanguard that is striving towards some kind of perfection that has to be individual and by then also recreating the individual versus communal distinct. So these are some of the friendly criticisms that have been uh, directed towards this new paradigm or this part of the new paradigm of the British freedom movement. So I'm curious, what do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, uh, that has uh, actually uh, changed a lot, right? Because now the cadres are not only, I mean, when we say cadres, when we say members of the movement, members of the movement are not only in the mountains. Actually, probably as many as there are in the mountains, uh, there are also in society. I mean, uh, working in Rojava, working in Europe, working in Turkey, working in Iran, working in Iraq, among the communities. And from the, uh, actually, it was, I mean, this criticism can be uh, directed to the movement definitely uh, be, during the um, uh, the periods uh, between 2002 and 2010, when it was going through this paradigm change and actually turmoils, uh, inner turmoils, and when they were uh, separating themselves from the society. But immediately with 2011, uh, with the uh, transformation of the movement and with the restarting of the guerrilla war, Actually, most of the cadres, not most of the cadres, but a lot of the cadres have come uh, to the ground, I mean, to the society, and they are trying to enact what I call uh, human um, as a friend genre among the people. That's one thing. And in Rojava, actually, probably you have witnessed it. I witness it every day in Europe. But the question of asexuality remains. And that has been, of course, one thing that has that is uh, directed as a criticism against the movement and the movement therefore has developed a new now i mean asexuality why asexuality let me first explain that asexuality was um has been an uh, important component of the pad because uh, women are according to the kurdish movement because you know women uh, are the um basically uh, the people who should constitute the new human, uh, the free human, the truthful human, and so on and so forth. Uh, woman falling in love or having sexuality with men uh, had, have meant, meant that they would be automatically somehow linked themselves again to heterosexual, to uh, enforce heterosexuality and the power relations that comes with heterosexuality. So that's why uh, women as an ideology and men as an ideology have ex accepted asexuality as their um, you know, orientation. Uh, but um, nowadays, be exactly because they, they are rethinking you know, how uh, the, the humanness that we are trying to practice, how can that be uh, made intelligible and made uh, popular among the Kurdish people? They are coming up with new ideas, like uh, equal loving partnership is one name that they are giving to it. But uh, I think it's still problematic, but because it still talks about uh, partnership rather than um, uh, uh, imagining maybe other forms of attachments than partnership. Uh, but they are experimenting and exploring uh, new ways um, of uh, imagining uh, friendship and reproduction together on which the sustenance of the population uh, demands at this point where Kurds are being massacred all over the place. Is that a response to your question? Absolutely, it's wonderful. I guess one could add to this the question or the problem perhaps of don't, uh, do women then constitute a sense of a vanguard? And uh, are we then again repeating a movement in which the most oppressed, or in this case, the first oppressed, right? The first and most oppressed, do, uh, do necessarily need to become the leaders 
of the here in the United States, the language would be probably of the new revolution or of the new social movement. So that is an adjacent criticism that I've heard actually once in Rojava from one of the internationalists who was having second, uh, second thoughts or perhaps doubts about uh, what uh, she called the vanguardist touch. So I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Well, I am very happy about that. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't see it as a criticism. I, I mean, if, if we, even if it is directed as a criticism, I think we should open it up, up to debate because I think that uh, women uh, are assuming, I mean, because when women, uh, I uh, actually um, uh, use, I mean, a little bit of quantum, uh, like the language of quantum physics because the movement uses it, uh, and the, uh, these overtures, flirtations, I mean, leader is a step leader, you know, it inspires people, not necessarily, not necessarily a vanguard in the sense of making decisions, but a vanguard in the sense of inspiration, uh, inspiring people to become their best, to practice humanness to change who they are and to define them, themselves by what they want to become and not what, what they already are. Um, because the past and history is always already unavailable uh, due to colonialism and patriarchy. So I see this as a positive aspect of the movement, actually, that there are these step leaders, if you want, in this, in society, in the movement, and most of these step leaders are women who have, you know, who are um, flirting, if you want, with newness, flirting with new forms of communications, with new forms of being, and becoming inspirational nodes around which people uh, collect. But that doesn't mean that they are the decision making makers, because if they become the decision makers, then they would be, as you say, the leaders who once again steal the means of production, reproduction and self-defense and so on from the people. But that's not the case. Leadership is not something that is necessarily um, that kind of stealing, in my opinion. Leadership is, on the contrary, being an exemplary person who uh, invents new norms for her desires and by that very fact becomes a, a story that can become citable, that can become, uh, uh, yeah, that's what I uh, actually... Uh, yeah. I think that's a beautiful distinction. Thank you very much. And I like very much also how it connects back to the idea of the truth and the idea of freedom, friendship. But let me then open this to other people who I'm sure have something to ask. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Yeah, this is about, um, which... They want to hear more about Antigone. Aha. Uh -huh. So, Antigone. <laughs> <laughs> You are hesitant. Uh, because I use I used so much Antigone in my book, I'm very I'm a little bit bored with it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean I'm not hesitant. I just think uh, that Antigone is a great start for thinking about all of these that Matt you have written here: fate, gods, destiny, justice, revenge, and humanness and the role of violence and how human humanness can be practiced. Uh, but I think there are uh, many differences. Mm, uh, uh, and I want to, I, I actually, Antigone has built, because Antigone has been so much an inspiration for feminist political philosophers, has been the ground against which I have explained the Kurdish movement. There are, uh, I, and there are a few points I would like to make. One of them is Antigone because it's a play. It's so, I mean, it pisses me off, absolutely pisses me off that so many feminists and other philosophers can uh, embrace Antigone and her act of defiance, which results in the death of so many people also. Uh, and they cannot look at the face of the death that female warriors in Kurdistan, for example, bring 
uh, and and that they cannot take uh, the basis of um, the, uh, they cannot take. Uh, uh, I mean, crayon doesn't die. The fact is, in the real world, crayon doesn't die. Crayon dies because it's a play. It's a tragedy. Uh, and Antigone's ideas, in the end of the day, prove themselves to be right because we need an ending to the tragedy. But real life is not like that. There is no ending. There is always praxis. There is always regeneration. The crayon survives. Antigone dies and other Antigones have to um, come up and they have to recite the uh, norms that Antigone has invented in order to pursue her desire. I think when we focus of, on Antigone as a polit philosophical text, we miss all of these, the messiness of real life. We can take it as a ground, as a, as a, um, as a, uh, you know, a feminist heritage around which a lot of concepts have uh, grown, but these concepts have to be tested against real life and real antagonists. I mean, that would be, um, I think, an answer I would like to give at this point. Um, and uh, one more thing, maybe linking my talk to yesterday, my this talk yesterday, Antigone, of, after all, is an elite. I mean, she is, uh, her life is worth. I mean, people die for her. He, Heman, right, Creon's uh, son, uh, is so upset for Antigone, and Creon's son is so important for the symbolic order. But actually, uh, so Antigone is an other, which has to be dealt with. But Kurdish women are not. They can die. They are fungible. Who cares that they die? So what we learn from them in terms of humanness, in terms of truth, in terms of um, all these things that you have uh, put here, Nat, uh, is, I think, more valuable. Is that, a question? is that an answer that's legitimate? Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Najan. Uh, I don't know. Uh -huh. Jen, do you want to come closer? To yeah, that? sure. So... Yes, yesterday I mentioned about um, that I saw a parallel between disability and the women's movement and how, especially in, in Kurdistan and that area where people are not seen as human. And if you saw that translated in other places as well, because in the US it's like really obvious to me that um, disabled people are not seen as fully human if that makes sense. Sure. I mean, I have uh, actually um, yesterday and today, uh, I when I, um, I mean, why do I write? Why am I interested in the Kurdish movement? After all, I'm not anymore, I mean, an academic with a position. I have lost my position. I'm in exile. I have been fired and all of that. Well, I am still writing about this because I want to bring in exactly uh, uh, enter such dialogues. You know, how does humanness look like, the praxis of humanness look like from other people's, other oppressed people's perspective? Because, you know, we don't want to be, um, we don't want to be um, in this place where, we are uh, we are delegated to the position of non-being. We want to become beings, which means we all the time trying to, you know, uh, find new laws for our desires, uh, find new ways in which we can be, we can become, because we are not accepted, and and our we, our history is complicated because we don't have access on un, an unmediated access to our history that is not somehow uh, been written by the dominant uh, uh, genres. So we are all the time in the process of invention. But I think the important thing, the most important thing is bringing our inventions into dialogue so that we can create a new, if you want, declaration of human rights, some new universal institutions, some new universal agreements. 
So I think all these ways in which, um, yeah, people who have been rendered inhuman um, practice humanness uh, have to come in dialogue. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Loved the talk both today and yesterday. Um, my question deals with the notion of friendship and um, and both its connections to the ordinary usage of it and also the distinctions um, that make this a really rich concept that is not just the normal way it's used um, and sort of just distilling some of the, the most crucial elements of it from that rich multidimensional presentation about friendship. Um, and exactly getting to the core of, 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 of what this um, specific usage of that concept is. Um, specifically, one of the ways I was a little bit confused is there's the kind of personal friendship, and then there is also friendship in the sense of camaraderie. Um, and then there's also sort of the ways we can treat strangers as friends in a specific sense, although it might not have the real personal elements that it has with those much we're much closer to. And then, and yeah, also there's um, the other dimension to this question is there's also times when you're organizing with people in different social movements, but they may or may not be um, on that level of intimacy of friendship in one sense, but might be a friend in another sense. Um, so I guess, can you help me untangle all of these different conceptions specifically in regards to, to this notion of friendship? Thank you. I mean, I think what is like, uh, but, uh, what I um, would say, first of all, is I think friendship everywhere uh, is uh, a very important bond because it is uh, a bond that is not necessarily um, uh, dictated uh, by the uh, attachments encouraged by capitalist modernity i mean it's not a quest it's not you know a relationship of um for example in the nuclear like we are all in capitalist modernity are i mean we are workers but as much as important as that we are family members right mothers fathers children or something like that uh, so I think, I mean, uh, thinking about intimacy, thinking about love, thinking about attachment outside of filial relationships uh, is very important in the whole tradition of thinking about friendship. Uh, but in the Kurdish movement, I think what makes it different is uh, that friendship, uh, friendship is understood usually um, or friendship has been actually colonized, let's say, uh, through this nationalist idea of fraternity um, and uh, citizenship. And I, I think uh, like the Kurdish freedom movement reanimates it and re-signifies it and gives it back uh, its uh, import, its uh, due uh, content that is, something outside of relationships that are enforced by law or by convention or by habits, et cetera, et cetera. That's the um, thing that uh, would be usual to, I mean, that, that uh, the concept I'm talking about has commonalities with friendship. On the other hand, um, I think uh, the uh, when we say friendship as a genre of the human, we are, of course, attributing a lot of other things. Uh, and in that sense, I am relating friendship to the uh, with the signs of with truth, uh, freedom, and being. Okay, what um, I tried to say um, in the talk is uh, friendship is linked to the decolonization of truth in the Kurdish movement, because different from uh, friendship, from the ways in which we have been talking about friendship 
first of all, friendship in the Kurdish movement is impersonal. It is a position in a revolutionary grammar. It is not towards a specific person. It is towards all. So how do I become a friend to the world? How do I become a friend to the people? How do I become a friend to women is the question. And that involves a transformation that needs to be exercised, that needs to be achieved. Uh, and that transformation is achieved in the collectivity and with people who have the same goal of being, being friends in the world. So fruit seeking is the encouragement of transformation, if you want, transformation towards humanness. Um, freedom is building together, acting together as friends. And being is telling stories about yourself where you are not the author of your life story. You are uh, not the author or you are not the subject of a fulfilled life story. Rather, because you are a friend, your value is in your offerings, in your sharing of yourself with the world, in making yourself part of the world in the mode of play. Not so you are not a subject of tragedy, you are not the subject of melodrama, all of these occur within the confines of the nation and the family. Playfulness involves universality, impersonal playfulness. That is the mode in which you live and you die. Um, has that been an answer? Yes, that was epic. Thank you. <laughs> he said that was epic. I don't know if that's what kind of genre was that involved within the nation state grammar. <laughs> but let's, I'm, I just want to be mindful of the fact that it's 4 a.m. So let's have. It can continue, Andre. I'm okay. Still, I'm going to insist. Let's have one more question. <laughs> Leslie? No, somebody else? Laura, then Leslie? Leslie, then Laura. Okay. Leslie and then Laura. Sorry, my sunglasses because I have a headache, uh, light sensitivity. Um, but I have a question about I understood symbolic death as martyrdom. I don't know if that's correct in me um, understanding that. And then I was a little bit confused about then the symbolic life exactly. Um, I don't know if you can summarize that in a couple words. <laughs> I mean, but I, uh, the Tur look, the Kurdish uh, people and the especially the guerrilla or the cadres in general, members of the Kurdish movement, they are seen on the first of all, they are seen as terrorists. That's one kind of death. The moment you are seen as a terrorist, your life does not matter, right? You can as well be dead. Um, second. Because they live, the, they leave the place of kinship. They are also refusing the life that is supported by the symbolic order. They are refusing the ways in which life matters in Kurdistan. Because in Kurdistan, in of course. Uh, in any, I mean, in any, um, I mean, there's the whole, you know, uh, queer uh, on the productivity that people have talked about, you know, in a sense, the figure of the queer is very challenging to us exactly because of that. So uh, it's very similar to that figure. They are leaving the uh, reproductive um, Kurdish society, I mean, Kurdish society, which is based on a uh, reproduction of futurity and all of that. They are leaving kinship uh, uh, and they are refusing the uh, symbolic value that are given to them. So they are, in that sense, they are already dead, dead, both to the Western world and to the states, but they are also dead to the kinship. But to the states, they're, they're dead 
it has no meaning to the kinship, their death is more. And it is beyond these two deaths that they are acting. And they are acting under the sign of friendship. So they are, in a sense, dying together. They are living a, living a life after symbolic death. And then they are also dying together. Does that make sense? Yes. Laura and then Targo. Hi, thank you. I just wanna thank you for bringing together so many different ideas and theories from Sylvia Winter, the anti-colonial narration to Foucault. I never thought, you know, everything could come together with the Kurdish struggle. <laughs> But uh, since uh, I'm following up on the previous question, you bring the question of death very clearly in the picture. But my point that I probably want to connect with Andre's question about asexuality, um, how would you frame this in terms of purity? Right? So oftentimes in other social movement and also in conservative groups like you know isis or the the concept of purity is key to premise the death hmm? so you sacrifice the soldier the fighter sacrifices for the cause right so how yeah. how would you frame it differently in the case of the kurdish female guerrilla fighters how there is the connection between asexuality as a sort of purity and the martyrdom right, as a sort of purity that has been used in conservative context. So I know that you're not going in that direction, but I would like to hear how you frame that. And if that concept, how can we reframe that kind of dangerous way in which some people can see only purity in this, only a desire to escape into some higher level of purity instead of a more revolutionary reading. Thanks. Well, I mean, purity is a, a, actually don't go, don't go, because <laughs> purity is never, ever a, 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 a concept that is used in the Kurdish movement. I have never heard a reference to purity. What I have heard is simplicity. Okay. Uh, which is a very important concept, uh, or not simplicity as what do you call Andre uh, something without a decoration? Andre has stepped away for a moment. Plus, we're not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minimalist. <laughs> Minimalist, or a, uh, yeah, without any decoration, without any sort of simplicity, maybe or. Yeah, um, as you say, um, what did you say again? Someone put austere in the chat. Yeah, austere is like, you know? No, yeah. Minimalist, hard and That's the concept they use for their martyrs. That declaration, I like it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, because, as I said, the martyr is not someone you know who who has fulfilled a life but she he has uh, offered and he has made her her life be determined now and here without delaying its determination to the future and after all we are all going to die why wait when we love life so much? That's the kind of thought process. That's the kind of you know narration they have. Purity never ever comes up. Thank you. Hmm. I wonder if this is related to the concept of escaping the melodrama. You know, this mm -hmm. new, right that it's. That that asexuality is not about purity, but it's about escape from the melodramatic as a genre. Right. 
Right, that's how I would interpret it. Melodramatic is, of course, not some con not a concept that they use. I bring it yeah. as a yeah. way of uh, understanding it, and I would say yes, definitely. Um, I have I have the honor of having the last question, um, which is like a little bit specific, and I hope it's okay. Um, I was just thinking about the role of the mythological, which has been really important for yesterday's talk and today's talk. Um, and, I, I, and I'm really, really personally interested in the figure of Shah Maran. Um, and so I was just, and I also have noticed that um, there is a way in which her fig, or yeah, Shah Maran's figure is mobilized right now in Turkey by different social movements. And I was just, I don't know much about it in that context. And I would, I would just wonder if you had any impressions that you could share with us. Yes, Shah Maran is seen in the Kurdish movement, at least uh, for, as I said, women co uh, continuously uh, make reference to mythologies because, you know, history as such is not available to them as I've tried. So mythology is a very important source for inspiration. And Shahmaran is a source like that. And Shahmaran represents exactly that. You know, when you are deceived, when you love, when you fall in love, uh, falling in love is in a sense also a form of deception where women will be overpowered by men. And that's why. Uh, women, sh uh, asexuality is a way of freedom. So Shahmaran is uh, a, 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 a very much used to talk about that. Thank you, Nazan. Wish you were here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Whenever your visa comes through, come visit us, please. <laughs> I will, hopefully. Good night. Thank you. Uh, okay. Ciao, ciao. Okay. Take care. Take care.